Welcome to Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast with your hosts, John Gaspard and me, Jim Cunningham. Hey there, Jim. Hey, John. It's season two. I can't believe it's season two. Who knew a year ago that there'd be a season two? I guess the people in Switzerland probably did. Yes, I think he's way ahead of us there because they're all they're always ahead of us. But yeah, I'm, I'm really uh, thrilled. This is season two, episode one, which we're calling 201. That makes sense. I'm it tracking does. that. It does. I looked at it for a long time and thought, should it be 200? No, no. Uh, I know that the, the, the zero is an important uh, part of our mathematics system. But I think this is episode 201. It's season two, episode one. It's season, it's 201. That so, makes plenty of sense to me. And, and I'm um, more than a little excited, as I'm sure are all of our listeners, that the number of the episode is going to match up with the chapter in the book. It's going to do that until well into the season. I don't want to know. I just don't okay. want to know. I just want no, to just no, warn you that toward no, the end of the season. To, okay. I'm going to right. live. Ignorance is bliss, tis folly to be wise. I'm just going to live right here. So here we are, season two. We're going to be listening to the second book in the Eli Mark series, which is The Bullet Catch It. As sure. you mentioned, will be episode and chapter aligned for a good long time. And our special guest uh, for this episode is Dennis Palumbo, uh, who is not, not a magician. A magician. He's yeah. not a magician, not at all, not even a little bit. Uh, well, well, he's he's a magician at the keyboard because he's an exceptional writer. Uh, Dennis Palumbo is a psychotherapist who started his career as a TV and movie writer. Uh, he wrote for The Love Boat. He wrote for Welcome Back, Cotter. However, if there was going to be one thing I would say we should uh, mention about Dennis Palumbo, uh, in terms of his career before his current career, it would be uh, the penning of one of our favorite movies, My Favorite Year. I should warn any listeners, we're not going to talk about that in the interview primarily because when I asked him about it, he said, oh, John, oh, I've said everything I have to say about my favorite year. I'll just say this. Uh, I wrote a part for Peter O'Toole and got to watch him play it. So there, that's what he would have told you. So you don't need Yeah, to I like humility. Uh, I, I think he deserves a little more credit than that. But uh, having said that, it is one of my absolute uh, all-time uh, go-to movies. I watch it at least once a year. And so I was tickled pink to get a chance to talk to him. Also, uh, I have, I am of Palumbo lineage, not necessarily his, although if we go far enough back, I suppose, but my um, Italian side of the family is filled with Palumbos. They're all over the place. It's such a small world, isn't it? it is. I'd hate to have to clean it. Yes. So, um, I used to read Dennis Blumbo's column in the Writers Guild Monthly Magazine. And as he mentions, I think in the interview, it was the most popular column in the magazine uh, in which he talked about mental health issues that plague writers and creative people um, and just how to deal with them. Now, in addition to his practice as a psychotherapist, Dennis also writes a mystery thriller book series about a trauma expert, which is I'm kind of zeroing in now as to why he's yes, going to be with us. Are. Coming. Uh, it's coming. It's coming. I'm waiting patiently. He's a mystery writer who writes about trauma. Uh, he's a psychotherapist, and his latest book is called Panic Attack. And in the bullet catch, Eli is suffering from panic attacks. So I thought it'd be reasonable to talk to someone who not only writes mysteries, but also knows a thing or two about panic attacks. Before we get into that with Dennis, though, we chatted about how and why he made that uh, interesting move from writer to therapist. Can you just briefly tell us how you decided to make that transition from being a, a, a screenwriter and a TV writer to moving into psychotherapy? Sure. I mean, there's a long version. I'm going to give you the two minute version, Okay. which is I had been a screenwriter and TV writer and show business as the phrase goes, had been very, very good to me. I have no complaints about it. I did quite well. But after my first marriage ended, I went into therapy and I kind of fell in love with the process. So I started taking graduate classes in psychology, not necessarily thinking I wanted to change my career, but a part of me thinking, well, as a writer, it can't hurt me. And the next thing I know, I was getting my graduate degree because as a screenwriter, I was taking classes at night and on Saturday, but still working during the day. 
And then I began volunteering at a psychiatric hospital and a low fee clinic. And over the next four or five or six years, I began to acquire enough hours to actually sit for the exam. It, it takes about six and a half years to get a clinical license in California. It's a prolonged process. And I did it while I was still in show business. And then I had a kind of an epiphanal moment where I was uh, very late in this process. At this time, I was working, as I said, at this psychiatric hospital down on La Cienica. And uh, I was having lunch with a producer who was trying to get me to write a movie for him. And during the lunch, I kept looking at my watch because I was afraid I was going to be late to see my patients. So I'm driving down the street at La Cienica and I had kind of a road to Damascus experience, except it was on, you know, La Cienica. So it's a lot less dramatic and biblical. But I thought to myself, I'd rather be where I'm going than where I was. I think I am going to change my life. And it was a radical change. Um, I, I left show business. I retired totally. Uh, it was a strange 10 minutes where I called my agent, my manager, my lawyer, and I fired all of them and said, it has nothing to do with you. I'm leaving show business. They, their jaw, you could practically hear on the phone their jaws being full because I was having a particularly good year as a screenwriter. I'd written two pilots. And so it was a huge, huge uh, surprise to everyone. You know, it was like my secret. I was like Bruce Wayne. I had a secret identity at night. Instead of being Batman, I was taking classes. And so I shifted careers. And paradoxically, the column that you mentioned that I did for the Writers Guild magazine, it was called The Writer's Life. And it talked about the psychological issues that writers struggle with. It became the most popular item in the magazine. They polled all the members every year as to what they liked the best. And it was my column. And also, thanks to my column, it built my practice. Can there was we... like 3,600 members of the Writers Guild. And that's how my private practice built. It was based on people reading my column and coming into treatment with me. So that's the story. That's a great story. Can we, can we talk then? If you're dealing with, you know, creative people and writers, you know, at least initially, I'm sure it's branched from there, but what, what are there specific emotional issues that, that writers and, and creative people deal with or have in common? Oh, absolutely. It, interestingly enough, I still primarily 80% of my practice is creative people still. Writers, actors, directors, cinematographers. What happens mostly, to be honest with you, is people tend to present with their creative issues like procrastination or writer's block or fear of failure. And then within six or eight weeks, it moves into a more general type of therapy because in my experience, most creative people who have creative issues, these issues are inextricably bound up in their personal issues. And sooner or later, we're talking about their childhood, how they were criticized or how they were supported, uh, what their relationships are like, what their parenting is like now, the issues going on in their lives now, and how they connect to their childhood issues. And uh, so if you're for example, have a, a block. Let's say you're a writer and you're blocked, which happens to everyone. The block's not the problem. The problem is the meaning you give to it. If you say to yourself, well, this means the story's no good, or this means I'm not a good writer, or I bet Stephen King's never been blocked. And then it goes all the way to my parents were right. I should have gone to law school, you know? So the block itself is hard enough, but I think very common. I've been, I've been blocked a million times. The, the only difference between me and my patients is I don't give it any meaning. I just figure, well, that's because writing's hard. And the better you get as a writer, the higher the bar is in terms of what you allow yourself to write. So you're blocked because you're trying to make it better and better and better. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a frame that says, oh, if I, I'm blocked, there's something wrong with me, it's going to be much, much harder to work the problem. It's real simple. As a writer, you have to work the problem. If you make yourself the problem, it's 10 times harder to be a writer. Fascinating. That's, 
even though you made this radical change in careers, you you didn't give up writing and and you you've launched you did short stories and you've done this series. How did the series come about? And in that process, how did you decide to to create Daniel Rinaldi as as a therapist who deals with trauma? I spent five or six years in a supervision group with a guy named Bob Stollero, who's one of the experts on trauma in the world. He's one of those guys that like if there's like a terrorist attack in Israel. They call him to talk to the survivors. And I always thought a trauma expert is a great idea. And I thought that would make a great sleuth. I've always wanted to write a series of mysteries ever since I read Sherlock Holmes at the age of 10. I've always wanted to write a series of mysteries. So I said, well, what do I know about? Well, I know about therapy. I've been in practice a long time. I know about trauma because I've been trained by the best trauma expert in the world. And I can write about Pittsburgh, which is where I was born and is a city I love. I agree. Anyway, that's how Daniel Rinaldi came about. He, like me, Italian-American, grew up in Pittsburgh and is a psychologist. So it wasn't that much of a stretch, except I gave him a background dissimilar to mine. He's an amateur boxer. <laughs> I, I've always seen male therapists presented in film and television as not exactly alpha males. And so I thought, I'm going to throw a curve into this. I'm going to have a psychologist who looks like a boxer and is a former boxer, you know. And so that's where the character came from. All right. Now, this new book of yours, Panic Attack, uh, it kind of ties into what we're talking about in the second book in the Eli Mark series, The Bullet Catch, because Eli, who's a fairly grounded guy, suddenly finds himself suffering from panic attacks. Uh, mm -hmm. He's got an intense fear of heights, particularly if he's sort of on a balcony in the open air, fears that there's nothing stopping him from throwing himself off, except for him. And, and he yeah. doesn't really trust himself not to do it. So you got a book called Panic Attack. Break it down for us. What exactly is a panic attack? The thing about a panic attack is it's, it's a level of anxiety that is triggered by something, something in your life, like you're losing your job or your car is out of control or whatever. And the difference between that and just regular everyday anxiety is a panic attack has very deep physiological symptoms. Your heart's pounding so fast. And you, you really can't function. You can't catch your breath. That panic is a sense of impending doom. And mostly it's physiological. Mostly you feel like I'm going to die. I can't catch my breath. Uh, my body's out of my control. And I can't calm myself down. The hardest part about a panic attack is what you tell yourself while it's happening, which is different than, gee, I'm anxious. I'm going to a job interview. A panic attack, you could literally your breathing becomes so shallow and hyper attenuated, you faint in the hallway on your way to the job interview. Oh. It has a big physiological aspect. The, the, does that answer your yeah. question? I'm wondering on a, on a longer term basis, how do, you, how do you help someone out of this? Well, what you do is for the first thing you do is you try to uncover what the triggers might have been and then see a way that in their lives they can either negate those triggers a little bit better or eliminate them. You know, in other words, if you have a fear of spiders, I'm just giving you an example, and your kid hits a baseball and the ball goes under the house, I would advise you to go buy another baseball <laughs> rather than go under the house because you'll probably panic when you're under there. You know, so I always say, you know, when it comes to triggers for panic attacks, try to avoid them. If you get scared driving the freeway, take surface streets because people sure. commonly have panic attacks when they're on a freeway and everyone's driving fast. And you should certainly not want a career as a race car driver. You know, right. you find ways around the triggers that trigger your panic. Um, I was reading through some of the articles you've written. I think they're on your website. And you quoted Henry James as saying, plot is character under stress. Uh, yes, one of my favorite quotes. And what you've done with Rinaldi is you've taken an expert in a field, but you've given him kind of the problem. He has to deal with it himself. He's not a Superman. Uh, oh, and I'm, God. I'm no, wondering no, no. how you came to do that and, and how you recognize the dramatic value of having a, a character who is dealing with stuff. Because I will say in the Eli Mark series, 
Eli is a highly imperfect person, and that's what readers seem to like about him, that he is often wrong, that he has, he feels guilt, he feels shame, he feels like he's not good enough all the time. So what was your thinking in making Rinaldi flawed like his patients? Well, first of all, I, I like flawed characters myself. And secondly, I thought, you know, you don't become a therapist because you're psychologically healthy. I mean, <laughs> and I felt that if he's going to be a trauma expert, it's because he's experienced trauma. And so I had him, as you know from the story, his backstory is that he and his wife were coming out of a restaurant. They got mugged by an armed guy and the, they were both shot and his wife was killed. He was in the hospital and recovered and then had survivor guilt. Why am I alive and she's not? And so that was part of his mission then to help victims of violent crime, which is what he's, he's a, a, a civilian, but he's under a consultant's contract with the Pittsburgh police who refer trauma victims to him, people who have been carjacked or they were uh, a teller in a bank that got robbed or whatever uh, for two reasons. Number one, they need the psychological help. But number two, if they're going to be a witness, they've got to be copacetic enough to be able to be on the stand. So he gets victims. And one of the things that I like about my series, we rarely have anything to do with the victims of a crime in crime novels. They're just there as a cog in the machine. Now let's go get the bad guy. What I like is the victims are center stage in my books, even though the bad guys are bad. And my hero does foolishly get involved because as some of his friends and colleagues think that he has a death wish. As one of his friends said, you think that if you get killed going after one of these people, you make it up to, to your wife. Uh, there's even a moment in Panic Attack where he's at, he inadvertently gets stuck chasing a bad guy, which was not his intention, but he gets stuck doing it for a series of reasons. And the bad guy fools him and turns on him and points a gun at him. And he thinks he's going to get shot. And he says, I'm sorry, Barbara. And this is five books after the first one. So he still has her in his head. He'll always be haunted by that. My guy is in the real world. And he has the real issues that a therapist in the real world deals with. How do the therapists in the real world react to the books? Most of my colleagues like the books very, very much. And they all say what a fantasy figure he is because he's so brave. Most therapists, you know, we're not um, alpha guys. We're, we're not going to be first responders, uh, you know, when something blows up. We're perfectly happy to talk to the victims in the safety of our consulting rooms if they've gotten blown up, but we're not going to run in there, you know? And so the fact that my character is a little more willing to put himself in the line of fire, my colleagues find that amusing, but they also like how, because it's in first person, we're in Daniel's head and you get, the general reader gets to be in the head of someone who's actually a therapist. Yeah. Can we just talk then about creating a character that the reader cares about? You're talking about it right now, but just how do you do that? How do you, what are the steps you take? The key, I think, to creating characters is mining your own experience. What makes you anxious? See, or what makes you excited? Are you a curious person? Are you someone who needs to know stuff? We all are curious. Why, why do you think all these real crime shows are so popular? We all want to know. And so the key to making a character relatable is that their concern should be similar to the reader's concerns. Even if they're doing something the reader doesn't do, the readers are not usually spies or private detectives or private eyes. Or in my case, they're not trauma experts. But the more human they are, in that they have foibles and concerns and their feelings get hurt, all of which happens to my hero because he's me, except he's brave. He's a brave version of me. He has all of my neuroses, all of my hero complex, all of my insecurities, my Italianness. Uh, he loves the Steelers. You know, he comes from a blue collar background and was the first person in his family to have a profession, to wear a coat and tie, to get a graduate degree from a university. So I took some of those traits of mine 
the good, the bad, the ugly, and I put them into my character. And so people can really relate to him. The only thing they can't relate to is he's braver than and more resourceful mm -hmm. than most readers are. But, you know, so what? So is Jack Reacher. And we like characters. I mean, I love, for example, Miss Marple. I'm less of a Hercule Poirot fan because he's a little too stick up his butt. But I love Miss Marple. I love the idea of a nosy old lady in a small village. Yeah. And that just, her character is what matters. And so I think the key to answer your question, kind of long-winded answer, I think, as I'm a therapist who works with writers, I think all writing is autobiographical. Whether you intend it to be or not, I think it is. Right. Yeah. Jim and I are big fans of Aaron Sorkin and West Wing and, and Sorkin repeatedly, he, he's a broken record on when it comes to scenes and writing characters that, you know, you need an intention and an obstacle. That's it. Intention and obstacle. And I found most often with Eli that the best obstacle I can put in front of Eli is Eli. That his, it's his own issues that are going to make the scene interesting as opposed to bringing something in from the outside. I didn't, yeah, I, didn't... I think that that's true. I think that in my case, I mean, Daniel Rinaldi looks at it um, there, there, there's a line in, in Head Wounds, he felt his not dying as a result of that mugging, he called it his unearned luck, and I've been trying to earn it ever since. Mm -hmm. So his sense of mission is driven by that sense of, I don't know why I, I lived and my wife died. Yeah. I have to earn the fact that I'm alive. And so my mission is to do this. When I was growing up, when you thought of a, a therapist in a movie or TV show, I always went immediately to Judd Hirsch, who uh, in Ordinary People uh, mm -hmm. had had one dark evening with Timothy Hutton and asked him one question and everything was fine. What was the one wrong thing you did? I hung on. OK, you're fine. Off you go. You know, I'll validate mm -hmm. you, Parkin. We'll see you later. Can you think of examples in books, movies, TV shows where the writer has made a realistic and good use of either the th of therapist or the patient or that relationship where it was dramatically sound, but also realistic? Oh, absolutely. HBO did a series starring Gabriel Byrne called In Treatment. And it was the most accurate representation I've seen of a therapist, uh, certainly a male therapist. Lorraine Bracco is a pretty accurate depiction of a therapist in The Sopranos. But I think in treatment is the best example. In movies, the thing is, I, I, I do like Judd Hirsch's character in Ordinary People because he breaks the stereotype of this stiff necked guy, you know, sitting behind a desk. But movies demand single answers. It's sort of like Robin Williams and Good Will Hunting finally just saying, well, it's not your fault. You know, there is no sentence that, because see, there's no solution to life. And it's a mistake to go into therapy thinking there's going to be some perfectible version of yourself in the future. That if you just get enough therapy, all the stuff that bugs you won't bug you. And see, I've been in therapy on and off for 30 some years. I'm as neurotic and insecure as I ever was. I just don't hassle myself about it. I think the purpose of therapy is for you to be okay with yourself rather than some improved version of yourself that you can love. And, you know, our culture tends to reaffirm constantly self-improvement and, you know, lose 20 pounds, get this job, get this car, you'll be very happy. None of that's true. Life is burdensome and difficult. And what you want to do is be okay with yourself as you ride the ups and downs of life. Try to make them, like I said about writer's block. Writing's hard, so you're going to get blocked. If you work the problem, you'll probably fix it. If you make yourself the problem and say, it's because of me that I'm blocked, then you're going to make yourself so unhappy. The self-recrimination is usually going to mirror some critical parent you had as a child, and you're going to be filled with shame. You know, I've had patients say to me literally stuff like, I bet Stephen King never gets blocked. But he'll tell you, he does. I remember Neil Simon, I saw an interview with him one time. He said, I got a million blocks. He said, I could, I could pay Fifth Avenue with how many 10 pages into a play I get and I'm stuck, so I put it away. If you have writer's block, it just means you're a writer. End of story. <laughs> you're done. That's it. <laughs> Yeah, writer's block uh, just means you're a writer. But what I thought was most interesting about what Dennis said was, you know, it it isn't 
the problem it's your how are you relating to that problem you know yeah. are are you saying it's you or are you just saying well it's a problem that i'm dealing with yeah that that to me is the most uh salient point of the entire interview and and it just jumped out at me in uh listening to it the idea that it's uh, we assign meaning to something yeah. that doesn't necessarily have uh, that kind of meaning we just give it that kind of meaning and and i think we're used to kind of the idea that we blame ourselves for things we assume it's our fault and take on the guilt that's uh, you know I, I think we're all kind of there we get that we do that yeah. but just taking it one step further to the idea of hey, you are assigning meaning to everything. And if you just don't do that, if you don't say this means this or A, A plus B equals one plus, if you don't do that, you have a much better chance of, of kind of loosening up and figuring it out. Uh, and, and, and that, as I have been reading some other stuff, that idea of us assigning meaning we don't understand anything and yet we assign meaning to something that we really shouldn't do that and and so that jumped out at me uh in listening to the interview and you know it's not it's not that new of an idea i believe you'll recognize the phrase uh nothing is good or bad but thinking makes it so yeah, it's hamlet certainly that's hamlet uh, yeah and you uh, th that that idea needs to be revisited for me personally, on a daily, sometimes hourly basis, that it's my thinking about something that gives it its context or meaning. And, and really, if I step back, uh, I, I have a much better chance of staying loose, which, yeah. it, which I think from all of my performance experience, that's the key to a good performance. When I get tight, when I worry, when I assign this or that to this or that, that's when I get in my own way and I can't get out. And But when I'm loose and when I'm just riding the wave, that's when I, I feel like I do some of my, uh, some of the work that I, I enjoy or am most proud of. Yeah. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. And, and you can see you can certainly see in, in the way he explains it that that's, that's something that is a common problem with everybody is that yeah. you know was that old joke i'm my own worst enemy and then the response is well not while i'm around <laughs> um, it was so great having him just condense that idea so simply because i just we'd thought about it but he just said it so well so succinctly uh, that i can take it with me is the, yeah. is the great part about that interview and so here's just one more example of this podcast doing me personally some good and yes. really if even if the people in Switzerland say, "Yeah, we knew that," and uh, we're we're way ahead on that, that's fine. Uh, the Swiss and their chocolate, their cheese, their watch, and their knives. The, but me personally, getting some absolute bedrock good out of this podcast today because of Dennis Palumbo's I, succinctly saying, "Don't assign meaning to things, and you're going to be happier." Yes, of course. At some point, I'll need to reveal to you that I've never actually released this podcast, but these are just one-on-one <laughs> -on -one sessions to try to try to get you on track. Boy, I, I don't care. I, I really don't care anymore. I, this is all about me, and it's always, always, always been about me. So I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy. Very anyway, um, Dennis's latest book is called Panic Attack. If you go to uh, our show notes, He's kindly provided us a link where you can read the first chapter of Panic Attack. He's a great thriller writer. He's one of those writers where uh, you go, I'm just going to read one more chapter and you get to the end of that chapter and go, oh, I got to read the next chapter and find out what happens. Also, if you go to our YouTube page, and I don't know why you wouldn't, no. there's a video of a reading of one of uh, Dennis Plumbo's short stories called The Theory of Murder, which has an appearance uh, by Albert Einstein. So if you're looking for some short stories, uh, check out Dennis Plumbo's From Crime to Crime or listen to uh, a reading of A Theory of Murder on our YouTube channel or click on the link in the show notes and read the first chapter of Panic Attack. Speaking of first chapters, and yes. I think that's going to go down Here in the, we go. the Hall of Fame of segues. <laughs> If there is such I was a hall of fame, for it, but you got there. I did. I, I didn't did. Feel you needed me. 
you know, I, what I did was I didn't assign meaning to it. I just went there. But speaking of book series and first chapters, let's jump into chapter one of the second book of the Eli Mark series, and then we'll talk about that afterwards. So here, for your listening pleasure, Jim has the book open, page one, chapter one. Here we go. The Bullet Catch, an Eli Mark's mystery. Chapter one. It is terrifying, utterly terrifying. That's a strong word. I considered my word choice. Yes, yes it is. Is this a new fear? Another pause. Well, I finally said, it's new to me. Well, that's what I meant. Can you name it? What do you mean, like Pete or Louise? This elicited a deeply felt and well-earned sigh. I sensed, not for the first time, that Dr. Bakke regretted taking me on as a patient. However, he was young, and his office appeared to be new. The rent payments had to come from somewhere, and so he had, probably he was now thinking, against his better judgment, said yes. So here I was, a first-time therapy patient in the office of a therapist who was still using metaphorical training wheels. Is the fear specific? Yes. When does it manifest? Well, I said, searching for the words to describe it, I feel it mostly when I'm walking across a bridge or standing near the edge on the roof of a tall building or on a balcony overlooking a high atrium, I added. Ah, he said, at long last, taking a note on his unsullied notepad. Acrophobia. I shook my head. No, I've always had acrophobia. I mean, not in a debilitating way. I know what that's like. This is different. Much, much worse. Terrifying, actually. He stopped in mid-stroke. How so? I didn't answer immediately. My knees get weak, my head gets light, and I am consumed from head to toe with panic. Real, palpable panic. I hesitated for a moment, as I had never said this part out loud before. I get this feeling... I said finally, when I'm on this bridge or high ledge, there's really nothing stopping me, and I should just go ahead and jump. Dr. Bakke leaned back in his recently purchased, slightly squeaky leather chair. There was the slimmest trace of a smile at the corners of his mouth. Is that the first time you've said that out loud? He said. I took a deep breath. Yes, I said. I knew it, he nearly cried out, coming just short of pumping his fist in the air. He sat back in the chair, clearly satisfied with his diagnostic achievement. He made a note on the pad. It was the happiest I'd seen him all hour. So, to recap, you've got uncontrolled panic, an intense physical reaction, suicidal ideation, and a sense you're losing control and might harm yourself if you can't get away from the high location? Bingo, I said. Hearing it read back to me made it sound much more clinical than it felt. You'll be relieved to know, he finally said, as he finished his notes. What you're experiencing is not really all that rare, and it is certainly treatable. Great. What is it? Well, he said, nodding as sagely as a twenty-something therapist can, There's no clinical name for it, although some call it the imp of the perverse. It's when your mind suggests you should do something that really isn't in your best interest. Like a voice in your head, I asked? Perhaps. Or just a sudden overpowering feeling you should do something wrong. It manifests itself in many different ways. In your case, it's most likely an outgrowth of acrophobia. Many experts think it might simply be a reaction to stress. He flipped the page in his notebook, smoothing out the next page before looking up at me. So, what's going on in your life, Eli? What might be causing you stress? Okay, let's see, I said as I sorted through where to begin in the rich tapestry which was my life. I'm a magician, making my living doing corporate events, parties, restaurant work, that sort of thing. How's business? I shrugged. Not too bad. It comes and goes. 
I struggled to generate more information that might be construed as relevant. So, let's see, I'm 34. I got divorced a year, no, almost two years ago. My wife was having an affair with a co-worker. Sadly, not so uncommon, Dr. Baki commented quietly as he scribbled. So I've learned. She's an assistant DA. He's a homicide cop, so you can imagine the romantic possibilities of that unholy union. Dr. Baki shot me a glance over his glasses. The look suggested I should stick to the facts. Anyway, so we got divorced. I had nowhere to live, so I moved back in with my Uncle Harry. My Aunt Alice had recently died, and they had almost raised me, so I moved back into my old apartment above his magic store over on Chicago and 48th Street. Chicago Magic? I sensed this was more detail than he really wanted. And what's that been like, he said without looking up. Not too bad, actually. Harry and I, we've always gotten along really well. He's a magician, too. Very old school. He was on Ed Sullivan, that sort of thing. Basically taught me everything I know, but as he likes to point out, not everything he knows. And I've always loved the store. You know, it's home. I paused, not sure what else he needed. He finished his note-taking and looked up. Anything else going on recently? Anything that might have caused you undue stress? Ah, uh, let's see, I sighed. Oh, well, about six months ago, I was suspected of killing a bunch of people. Sort of a serial killer thing. Maybe you read about it. It was in all the papers. Three psychics were killed. I know what you're going to say. If they were true psychics, why didn't they see it coming? Trust me, psychics don't find that funny. Plus, my ex-wife's new husband was assigned to the case, so that was a hoot and a half. Anyway, during the course of the whole thing, I got conked on the head and also fell down a steep incline and got cut up pretty badly. I wasn't the killer, but I gotta tell you, it looked bad there for a while. The upshot was I got a girlfriend out of it, Megan. We were almost killed together, which sort of speeds up the bonding process. But then she felt we were moving too fast, plus she was in the midst of a divorce, and you know how stressful that can be. So we're sort of taking a break right now, although I'm not entirely certain what that means. But we've been on hold for a couple of months, and I'm just in limbo waiting for the break to be over. I added air quotes and immediately wished I hadn't. I looked over at Dr. Baki. He had ceased taking notes, although I wasn't entirely certain at what point he had stopped. It might have been around serial killer, or maybe when I got too conked on the head. I'm not sure. He turned in his chair, set his notebook down, and picked up what looked to be an old-style day planner. That's great, Eli, he said very slowly and a little too calmly as he paged through the planner. Just great. I think I'm going to need to see you two or three times a week, at least to start. That's chapter one, and that's our pal, Dr. Baki, who was named for a, a boss I had when I was in high school and college who was quite the character. That launches us into uh, The Bullet Catch, which is one of my favorite. Uh, I know you don't have favorites of with children, but sometimes it's books you do. Uh, I'm a big fan of The Bullet Catch just because it has two mysteries running through it simultaneously. Yeah. Um, and it's not like one of those clever things where at the very end, they both uh, dovetail. They don't. They're solved separately. But it, it was inspired by the Raymond Chandler book, The Long Goodbye. And people who know The Long Goodbye, the book, not the movie, will see echoes of it. Um, throughout. So anyway, we'll be back on the next episode with chapter two. On that episode, we're also going to be talking again to our pal, Steve Cohen. We talked to Steve early on in season one, but we have him back because he's one of the few magicians who's not only performed the bullet catch, but he has the scars to prove it. Yeah. But it's a, it's really a dangerous, dangerous trick. There's a book and I'm sure the total is wrong now, but mm -hmm. there's a book called 12 Have Died about the magicians who have performed the bullet catch and it cost them uh, their lives. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a crazy trick to perform. Yeah. Even if you think you've got it all figured out, it's, it's easy for some small little piece of it to go wrong. And the next thing you know, uh, you, you've got a piece of lead uh, yeah. in, your, in your body. And uh, 12 guys have died performing this thing. And I think that number's on the low side. I believe uh, that Joshua Jay has said that number is wrong from the beginning, that there were more 
uh, even as the book was written. And we will, in a couple episodes, talk to Joshua Jay about what he calls tragic magic, other kinds of situations people have died doing magic, but the bullet catch being the most famous of them because it has such a dark, dark history. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of, of people who are coming up, a lot we've of got, coming up. we just have... Uh, you know, last season was great. This season is just as great. I'm amazed the people who've said yes, including Stan Allen. Jonathan uh, Lovett. Uh, yeah, John Armstrong, Harrison Greenbaum. Uh, I laughed from the beginning to the end of that interview with Harrison Greenbaum. And uh, just so many uh, great interviews coming up that I can't wait to revisit all of them. Yeah, it'll be great fun, including uh, Kayla Drescher, who yeah. runs the Shazam podcast, if you haven't listened to Shazam. Um, David Parr, who, I, 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 yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people. Yep. Anyway, that's what's coming up. Don't forget to uh, check out Dennis Plumbo's short story on our YouTube channel and uh, the, the link to the first chapter of uh, Panic Attack in the show notes. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I will do all of that. You know me. I'm uh, way into our show notes and our YouTube channel. <laughs> I don't think you've done either one of them. Also on the YouTube channel, I've been posting uh, some past movies that I've made. So if you want to go there and see stuff, including uh, a Jim Cunningham appearance in two of them, Jim appears as a uh, frazzled movie producer in uh, The Cookie Project. And I believe his first movie performance ever as a rather disgruntled deposition giver in Grown Men, which was still one of the best days of shooting I've ever had with you and John Schumacher and Peter Moore and uh, Jen Sartorati. Um, just a, a fun, fun day of shooting. And, you know, one of the two days for me <laughs> of movie shooting. So it was one of my favorites. You've done movies. You're in that Bigfoot movie, aren't you? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, let's, uh, yes, that, there is a Bigfoot movie floating around that I, uh, do some really some of my finest movie acting in. And if you want to hear your name mentioned, watch Donnie Darko, because I believe a major character in Donnie Darko is named Jim Cunningham. So That's even though true. it's not you. Anyway, thanks for listening to this, uh, what is turning out to be a rather eclectic episode. Uh, we're <laughs> great, grateful to be back. Thank you so much for listening uh, as we launch into season two with The Bullet Catch. If you get a chance, uh, subscribe and leave a review uh and tell your friends about us yeah i i think all of those things are are really good ideas i, I, I just want to add my my voice and my weight to both of those ideas subscribe and leave us a review it really does make a huge difference uh in terms of how many people see or may enjoy this podcast if you're enjoying it boy uh, nothing could be easier or uh, better for us than to leave a review and or subscribe. Please. So anyway, that's it for us. We're going to head out and not assign meaning to things. No. And we'll, and we'll see you on the, the next episode. Uh, thanks, everybody. Take care, everybody. I'll see you next time. This has been Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast with your hosts, John Gaspard and Jim Cunningham. Produced by Albert's Bridge Books at Grass Lake Studios. Find this podcast and all the books in the Eli Marks series at elimarksmysteries.com. That's E-L-I-M-A-R-K-S, mysteries.com. And thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.